So I have a lot to live up to if I'm amusing. Um, welcome and thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, my Scotch colleagues will recognize my little dog, Pete. I gave a Skype a few years ago to an address here in Scotland and he unexpectedly turned up. So I wanted to be sure to include him uh, today since I'm in Scotland. And if anyone wants to get a hold of me by email or get a copy of my talk, my email is right here and I'm very easy to find. So um, I come into this from very different perspectives and I'm gonna talk about those in a second. Today I've got a rather a great challenge, which is to talk about where we've come from and where we're going. And in thinking about this, I thought it might be the easiest to talk about three different lines of research, all of which started in the 1970s and continue to today. And also to talk about some of the changes in our knowledge and some of the gaps, as well as some of the things that we do know. And then I'll try to wrap the whole thing up very quickly and talk about some issues of naming. So I come into this with a perspective of being a clinician, a researcher, an advocate, a teacher, if anyone is interested. You can go online at iTunes University and type autism in Yale, and 15 lectures from an undergraduate course at Yale that I've taught for 30 years will come up. I'm also a journal editor, and I'll talk a bit about that. I have some conflicts. I have royalties from books. I'm the editor of the Journal of Autism, Springer and I have some foundation grants, and I apologize because I come into this with an American perspective which will be somewhat different than either a UK or a European perspective at the same time with many areas of overlap. And I also, in that regard, want to mention my fellow citizen, um, Mark Twain, who once said that the UK and the US were two countries divided by a common language. I hope that's not true today. Um, so, a quick discussion of terms. Autism spectrum, which is the current terminology we tend to use, covers autism, Asperger's, PDD, and OS. I'm gonna conclude by talking about maybe the attempt to come up with a better term. Keep in mind that there's a broad range of syndrome expression of autism. In some funny way, that's one of the conclusions of this talk. Back in the 1970s and 1980s, we thought there was autism and that was it. We now realize that there's actually a rather broad dimension of autism and how it's expressed and it verges from disorder into difference, and we'll talk a little bit about that. When I talk about the normative population, I'm talking about the neurotypicals, some hypothetical, uh, typical person that one will never ever meet in reality. Uh, so th really, the interest in autism started in the 1800s. Uh, we have case reports, or some in the states from the, I think the 1880s, that probably are reports of children with autism. There are reports from Europe. Probably, indeed, Etard's description of Victor the wild boy may have been a child with autism. The major landmarks, of course, were Leo Connor in 1943, who talked about what he called early infantile autism, and a year later, Hans Asperger, and both of them you see here, who talked about autistic personality disorder in a group of boys. The thing both these terms had in common was the autism, the trouble with social interaction and understanding uh, intuitively uh, social things, and we'll come back and talk about that quite a bit. Uh, official recognition for autism came in 1980 in the United States, and this led to a tremendous explosion of research. Uh, the last time I checked, it would take every day if you were to read every single peer-reviewed scientific paper on autism. These days, you're reading about 6.5 papers a day to keep up with the field. So that says actually rather a, a bit. Uh, there are many different interesting changing perspectives on autism. Um, we're gonna talk a lot about social information processing, but at the moment, I think one of the interesting things that seems to be an emerging theme is that work on the brain and genetic mechanisms is starting to come together. This will be a very interesting line for the next 10 years. As I mentioned, our early impression was that autism was rather rare and quite distinctive. We now know that it's, that's actually not true at all. It's rather common. There was an early assumption of an association with schizophrenia, which turned out to be more or less totally unfounded. And there was an early and very unfortunate impression that parents of children with autism were likely to be more educated, and this led to the notion that perhaps parents caused autism, traumatizing a whole generation of parents. Work in the 1970s began to suggest autism was a brain-based disorder. Children with autism had higher rates of epilepsy. It was also strongly genetic. Identical twins had higher rates of autism than fraternal twins. And it also became apparent that structured treatment programs were much more effective than unstructured psychotherapy. After 1980, there's been a real explosion of interest. 
and this includes public interest, as you've already heard this morning. Many more people now know, when you say the word autism, what you're talking about. In the US, there were two uh, relatively important landmarks in early 2000. One was a book from the National Research Council in the United States called Educating Young Children with Autism that said that starting early with intervention made a difference. And it made a number of recommendations for how that intervention should be done. Also, the first practice guidelines began to appear in the US talking about screening, uh, talking about the care of children with autism for physicians. This was a real landmark. There was an attempt to make these evidence-based, and we'll talk more about that. The idea of using treatments that are shown to work is an important and recurring theme. We've also had much more parent advocacy around the world, which is very, very important. Uh, we've had more f foundations supporting awareness. We have much more interest in the part of the public. As you've heard this morning here in Scotland, there have been tremendous advances. There still is much to be done, of course. Um, and we'll talk some about these gaps of knowledge. One I would underscore in boldface type is older adults. We know almost nothing about aging and autism, unfortunately. <clears throat> We've had more effective advocacy in the last 10 years. We have an increasing body of work on evidence-based intervention. And we have more integration of, of research work into practice. We now have a number of practice guidelines here in Europe, and I think uh, actually headquartered here, in, certainly in Scotland, if not the UK, the NICE guidelines, there are practice parameters that, come out, that came out just last year from the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. There's also been much more emphasis on screening and early diagnosis and detection of autism. And again, that sometimes has come at the price, at least in the US, of work with older children, adolescents, and especially adults. Research has increased in terms of sheer volume of papers, as well as sophistication. I think we now have at least six, if not more, journals specifically devoted to autism. I want to do a very quick overview of some of the research findings that I think are important. Obviously, this is very idiosyncratic to me. Other people would pick different things. We have also have a number of different theoretical uh, positions that have uh, been proposed to account for autism. These are things uh, with the alphabet soup of Tom, theory of mind, executive functioning, central coherence. Um, these are all very interesting. They've stimulated research. They all have their limitations. Uh, there's a very interesting book that's about to come out from Jessica Kingsley by, I think it's Nick Nicholas, I'm going to say Cowan, C-O-W-N, but it's on theories of autism, which I would recommend because he does a good job of looking at these theories, their various uses and limitations. This slide just shows you the growth of papers published every year, peer-reviewed scientific papers in autism. Uh, last year, there were, I think, close to 2,800 papers. And there's a year, several years' time lag before you can really be sure. But there's just been a tremendous growth in scientific peer-reviewed studies. We know a lot more about brain mechanisms in autism. At first, as I mentioned, we realized that children with autism had higher risks of developing epilepsy. We now know that autism is strongly brain-based. We know there are early changes in brain volume and morphology. And there has been much more sophisticated work on understanding the social brain. How does the brain process social information, the autism part of autism? What is that all about? Genetics, as I mentioned, the first studies actually conducted here in the United Kingdom by Folstein and Rudder showed a higher rate of concordance among identical over fraternal twins. Since then, there have been many different studies. These have used very different methods. They range from very large-scale studies to very small studies of highly informative families where there seem to be strong rates of autism. It's been very interesting, very productive, and also very complicated. Uh, the conclusion is that autism is very strongly genetic, with some room for some environmental action. Uh, and there's also awareness, as we've looked at more and more genes, and there are hundreds of genes that have now been potentially identified, that there's a very strong connection both to a broader spectrum of issues, not necessarily autism, but differences in terms of social processing, as well as in potential brain mechanisms. This is a slide from Emory that just uh, sums up some of the many different uh, genetic potential forms of autism. This is going to be very complicated to sort out. Interestingly enough, most of the genes that have been discovered relate to some aspect of brain functioning, nerve-to-nerve -nerve connections in the brain. And as this gets more sophisticated now with animal models, we're going to have the potential for the first time of looking at how genes and brain are expressed in animal models 
and potentially social behavior. So it's a very exciting time in terms of research. Understanding autism. So first and foremost, what is autism? Uh, this movie, some of you may have recognized it a lot in the United States to increase public awareness of autism, Rain Man. And Dustin Hoffman does a very good job of portraying a person with autism, especially for that uh, time and place in the US. Autism, first and foremost, is a problem associated with having difficulty processing social interaction. Um, and again, a, it's a very interesting set of problems, but they're also the problems are related to learning and perhaps an over-focusing on the non-social world. As we heard in terms of the autism-friendly environment, things that most of us who are more neurotypical would screen out very much are at the forefront of the perception and experience of the person with autism. And I want to say a little bit about that. We think that most babies, certainly neurotypically developing babies, come into the world with a social frame. That is, they are set up, they are wired to play the social game. They want to look, listen, and understand their parents. The face of the parent is the most important thing to the neurotypical baby in the entire world. This starts from birth and probably even before birth as babies listen in utero. Uh, we think that if you get very good at playing the social game from very early on, many things fall out from that. You get interested in communicating. You get interested in understanding people's feelings, a whole package of things. You get very good at fast information processing and putting all kinds of information together, gestures, tone of voice, words, body posture, etc., etc., et and you take it all and make sense out of it because you're very good at playing the social game. So by the age of one year, even before the child says his or her first word, the neurotypical child is playing the social game exquisitely. They're babbling with their native language, they're babbling with the right sounds, their prosody, the music of their language is perfect for their, their language. This all happens with no formal instruction. What happens if you don't have that social frame? We think that what happens is, uh, lots of differences in terms of what you pay attention to and how you learn. You really go with a different plan in terms of your learning. You're looking at things like contingency. You're looking for connections. You like routine and consistency. You like things to happen in a linear fashion. You like, don't like to have too much time pressure. So it's, again, a very different style of learning. And we see this expressed, we think, in some uh, basic, interestingly enough, biological processes. And to give you an example, Neurotypical folks are very attracted to faces from very early in life. Uh, this, this happens from birth. I'm going to show you in a, a second a picture of some things that you're going to say, oh, that looks like a face. It pulls your attention because it looks like a face. And then I'm going to show you a very characteristic response on EEG, brainwave, in response to faces. So here are some things that look like faces. None of them are people. And you can see it's a very diverse group of things. It's a house, it's an, a vegetable, an eggplant, it's a chair, it's a bowling ball. But because it's face-like, it pulls, typically, if you're neurotypical, your attention. And I mentioned EEGs. This is my colleague at the bottom, Jamie McPartland. Uh, this has now gotten very easy to do, uh, much easier than it was in the past. Uh, and it's very economical, and it's very fast. And so we can use this method much more efficiently than we used to. And you can see Jamie is even working with a little baby. We can do it from very early in life. And the thing that's interesting about this, and I know there's a pointer, but I've lost it. Oh, here it is. Is that if you average, if you show people faces, and they've got this funny hat on to look at the EG, you see a nice thing, which you might not even be able to see up here. If you see the typical people in blue, the neurotypicals, and then the folks with autism, you see there are differences both in terms of the depth of what's called the N170, which is just a technical term for when this happens, uh, in terms of looking at the average of the brain waves, but the depth, but also the length of time in terms of processing, probably speaking to the fact that the information is processed in a different way. It's not to say it's better or worse, it's to say it's different. And if we want to understand that, this is one of a couple of things that actually are very interesting. This is a study that was done some years ago uh, that I was happy to be involved with. My colleague Bob Schultz was the first author. We showed a group of very high-functioning people with autism and Asperger's, pictures of faces, and then pictures of objects. 
And this was in an fMRI, so it's a functional magnetic resonance imaging, perfectly safe, there's no radiation, but you have to be able to sit there, and the pictures come at you, and you say, same or different. You have button, same, button, different. Same or different, same or different, same or different. And we had people with autism, Asperger's, and typical folks, neurotypical folks, about the same cognitive level. And what we were looking at is a part of the brain called the fusiform gyrus, which is right about here under your ear on both sides. Neurotypicals, that fusiform area for faces, more blood goes to it. It's called the fusiform face area in the literature. And you can see in the neurotypicals, if I could get my thingy to work, uh, the blood going as you would expect. Whereas, interestingly enough, not so in the people with autism and Asperger's. Not that they weren't seeing them, but they weren't seeing them in this special place, in this special way. Interestingly enough, and there's some data to show this, if you have a person with Asperger's who has a special interest in toasters, let's say, and you show him a lot of toasters, that fusiform face area does light up. So it's not that it doesn't work, it's what it works for. And it doesn't work so much for faces. And lastly, work from eye tracking, which we got started in way back when. This was an undergraduate research paper, actually, at Yale that set this whole thing off. For those of you who do eye tracking, watch out for undergraduates. Um, uh, the first paper, we had very nice and clear data when we showed people uh, clips from Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. The neurotypicals look back and forth at the top half of the face, which is where about 90% of the social affective information is. And the people, high-functioning people, the autism and Asperger's, tended to look at the mouth, which, of course, is where good information is. It's verbal, but they're missing out on all that social-emotional. And again, speaks to very different issues in terms of brain processing of social information. This has gotten to be a very interesting and very complicated uh, body of work now, also sort of typical for the field. As people change methods just a little bit, things also change in terms of results. And can I get this to move? Please don't freeze up on me. There we go. So caveats. All these things, it's interestingly enough, you have to be very careful. People are always trying to tweak things. They change the method. They change the technique. They change the sample. They get different results. We're never quite sure. So one of the problems is we want to be sure that things replicate. And to do that, we have to be very scrupulous. And we have to look very carefully across studies to understand what's the same and what's different. Let me say a word about interventions. Good, I'm doing okay in terms of time. Uh, so, the early intervention models, psychotherapy, psychodynamic. Tell me about your mother. This did not very much good with nonverbal children. Um, and this had the unfortunate tendency to blame parents. This, of course, began to change. Parents also began to start their own schools. I think it was the same here in the United Kingdom uh, as in the US, where parents, they couldn't put their child in school. The schools wouldn't take them. They would start their own schools and they would use methods that had been coming from psychology to educate the child, and they were structured teaching methods. In the United States, we had a very major change. In 1975, Congress passed Public Law 94-142, which said that any school that took one cent of federal money had to educate every single child that walked through the door. Before that time, we think probably only one in five children with classical autism were getting service. After that time, they all were. And so this was the start of a big and major change. Um, we now know that having planned an intensive and appropriate intervention is important, and it helps people cope with their social learning problems. Let me take a little bit of a side to talk about evidence-based interventions. You've heard about this. It's very important. Uh, we know that this is based on the first practice guidelines. We're looking at evidence-based treatments. And we now know, of course, given the range of autism and the nature of autism, we need to be prepared to look at multiple treatments. I have to say that having, and I'm the author of a book on evidence-based treatments, and I author practice guidelines for that matter, there are some limitations in terms of samples that are studied that are highly selective, and there are some treatments that are used very commonly that have never, ever been shown to work in a randomized control trial. I will give you a quick example. This has never been shown to work in a randomized control trial. However, if you have to jump out of an airplane, I would strongly advise you to go with the parachute. <laughs> but when you think about it, of course, nobody's ever gonna do a randomized control trial with this. 
uh, it's, it's, it's funny, but it also makes a very serious point, which is you have to be very careful understanding how evidence-based treatments work. Uh, we have a number now of evidence-based programs. These include both treatments and model programs. So there are techniques that are evidence-based, and if anybody's interested, there are some very good resources to talk about techniques that are evidence-based. There are many of those, and there are a fair number of programs that are evidence-based. And there are various standards for what it means to be evidence-based, and you can take various approaches to this. But a very quick summary, applied behavior analysis, ABA, these were among the first practices developed in the United States. They're based on learning research. There's probably, if you just count the sheer number of papers, this is where the most action is at. This is thousands upon thousands of papers, mostly single case studies. Then we have a number of developmental models, probably the most prominent Sally Rogers uh, Denver Early Start model, which actually now has a very good evidence base. Uh, the Greenspan floor time approach, which I think has perhaps one paper showing that it works, and that's somewhat limited. Pivotal response, which is a very interesting kind of amalgam of both ABA and developmental models, developed by the Kegels at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And finally, we have eclectic models, Division Teach, which was the first statewide program in the United States that pulls from many different uh, backgrounds and disciplines. There are many uh, similarities of these programs and some differences. Uh, I should also point out they have a variable evidence base. Some of them are much easier to show uh, evidence base for than others. The eclectic models in particular, you can show the techniques using those in, the, in those models are evidence based. Showing the whole program as such, that's a rather more complicated undertaking. Oh, sorry, and the last thing I need to mention, matching children to treatments and vice versa. A common problem in the US, and I wouldn't be surprised if here as well, you will have a school that will have a nice program, a teach program, let's say. You have a child who needs ABA. That's a problem. There's the square peg in the round hole. We need to match children to treatments, not we need to make the children fit to what's available. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind for schools. Just having a program doesn't really quite cover it. You really need to be able to, provoke, to provide to the individual child and what he or she needs. <clears throat> uh, I've got to say there have been some real advances, especially in terms of psychopharmacology. This is where probably most of the great research is done with adults because it's an easier pop population to research. And there's some now very interesting stuff going on looking at using pharmacological approaches to target social difficulties in autism. The other thing that I would say it's been very interesting over the last year or two, a number of centers now, um, Sally Rogers model uh, at uh, Sally's place at Denver, but also some work with a colleague of mine, Pam Ventola at Yale, we've been able to show brain changes in response to treatment. Sally with EEG changes in response to her uh, Denver early start model, and Pam with using pivotal response for 12 weeks can show changes both in EEG and in fMRI, brain processing of biological motion. This is very interesting and exciting work. People are also doing this with other things like social skills. It's gonna create a whole new area in terms of thinking about can we identify early on children who are and aren't responding, and then we'll have to think about what that means in terms of how we adjust treatments. But it's very interesting. Curriculum and technology, uh, we've had low tech and high tech. And this is good, because low-tech is easy to use. Low-tech can use things like peers in school. Uh, we have very good programs in the US for preschoolers. Uh, typical preschoolers dealing with a child with autism. There's one that's called Stay, Play, and Talk with Your Buddy. I think it's by Howard Goldstein. And that's the curriculum. That's what you tell the four-year-old child who's typically developing. You stay with Jimmy, who has autism spectrum. You play with him. You talk with him. That's not too, that's not too hard. And kids can do it, and it's great, and it's low-tech. <clears throat> Visual schedules, other kinds of things to help us organize, great. High-tech, there's, I think, between 1,500 and 2,000 apps that mention autism in their description. And again, I emphasize when I quote numbers like this, they're approximate, but there are about two papers that actually look at the apps. So one of the problems is we sometimes, the field gets way ahead of itself where the evidence is. And again, I'm not saying don't use the apps. There are some great ones, and this is one that I commonly recommend. It's called iPromps. If you haven't seen it, it's a wonderful app developed by a father of a child with autism. But we need more data to show that these work and who they work for. 
improving outcome with earlier diagnosis and intervention, we're doing better. More and more people are going to college. As far as I know right now, the last time I checked, there were five students at Yale, which is a very competitive school to go to, five undergraduates with autism, which is amazing. It's great. It creates new challenges in terms of supports, and we're just working with that, and I've got a survey I'll show at the very end. If you know of a student in college with autism or Asperger's, we have a survey that's anonymous we'd be delighted to have them participate in. Um, we also have transitional programs that help children sort of go between high school and college. We now have probably 50 of these in the United States. Uh, the trouble is there's no data at all to show whether they work or not or who they work for. Uh, we do think that with earlier diagnosis and intervention, children are getting better. Unfortunately, not every child gets better, and we still need to support children that need more intensive help. We also know that we have people who are doing relatively well, who are moving on to have families and marrying, which is, again, fantastic. There's very little research with that population at all. What are the gaps in research? Well, right now, intervention research, particularly for older individuals, uh, we need, as I mentioned, to match the child's treatment to what the child needs. Um, there's very little work going on on aging at all. I mentioned evidence-based treatments. These are great, but really quite, quite spotty in terms of what they cover. We certainly need more work in the broader autism phenotype and understanding how the broader range relates to the individuals that most need treatment. And we've talked already about early diagnosis, which remains an important topic. This slide just summarizes in some way the, the challenge. This is looking at papers, and I'm sorry I stopped at 2008. These are all the papers published, and the black line shows you papers that are on intervention. So you can see there's a big gap between the papers published and the papers on intervention. Intervention studies are some of the hardest to do and get funded, and that's why they're so critically needed. I mentioned the Journal of Autism. I'm the editor of this journal. It's very important in terms of peer review, et cetera. We're going to get about 1,000 papers a year this year. When I started a little over 10 years ago, we got about 300 papers. So that's a real explosion. It creates a lot of, a lot of tensions in terms of reviewing papers. <clears throat> but it's interesting. And again, we talked a little bit about developing countries. We get papers from all over the world now. I have, I think, three papers from Nepal at the moment under active review. <laughs> And that's great. It speaks to more and more interest around the world in autism. It creates some challenges for us in terms of helping support colleagues in places where technology is more limited, where resources are more limited, and we need as a, as a, as a group to think about how we can do a better job. If you look around the world, the internet, and this slide shows you internet usage around the world over 24 hours, internet is amazing. On the other hand, there are some limitations. If you type autism into Google, the last time I did this, you get 25 million hits. How you're supposed to, as a parent, make sense of that, I really don't know. It's a problem. We talked about how um, there's a lot of variability in research over age, but again, you can just see that the amount of work going on that's available out there. The ex good news is there's an explosion. The bad news is there's an explosion. If you look at the top 100 websites in autism, one third are either trying to sell you something or convince you that they've got a cure in hand for your child. Those are the sites you should not look at. Uh, so that's another problem. We do know there's growing interest in third world countries. This is a problem when you know, you're a health visitor, you have maybe five minutes to give the child a vaccine and ask a couple of questions. So this is gonna be a real challenge. And in the United States, we have another real challenge, which is all our 50 states are all charged by the same federal law. Nobody has ever looked at how those 50 states are managing to work out <laughs> this problem. Let me say a word about diagnosis and DSM, and you can see my uh, sh short version of <laughs> my take on the problem. Um, DSM has some, some advantages, and the people that did this were well-meaning. Well they tried to do a good job working within the constraints they had. The move towards autism spectrum disorder is great. On the other hand, it's very clear now there are about 20 published papers, and there's at least one meta review of all the papers published, saying that DSM-5 excludes many people who previously would have gotten a diagnosis. Uh, this is a paper that um, <clears throat> Jamie McPartland was the first author, and I was an author, an author as well. We went back and looked at the old DSM-4 data, and you can see of the children with autism, Asperger's, PDNOS, increasingly numbers dropped off from the DSM-5 diagnosis. The um, solution to this was to say, okay, 
let the ones that already have a label keep the label. This is like running two trains on the same track without people knowing the schedule. Uh, this, was, this was not a happy solution. It really does need to be fixed. And it's, has been, it's, have, it's having an effect in the US in terms of eligibility for services. In the US, the label autism or autism spectrum is what gets you eligible for services. And speaking of labels and uh, moving towards the conclusion, moving past the A words, I had an opportunity about a year and a half, two years ago, to go talk to a group of Boy Scouts in Wallingford, Connecticut. They had a student who joined the Scouts who had Asperger's, and all he wanted to do was talk about his toaster collection. Turns out most nine and 10-year-old boys don't care a lot about toasters. And so he would approach them and want to talk, oh, I got a new Proctor Silex. And you know, the boys are looking at him. And uh, he dropped out because he felt like the kids weren't his friends. And they felt badly because they wanted to include him, but they didn't know how to talk about toasters. And so they asked me to come and talk to them, which I did. And it was a very interesting uh, audience. I talked for a few minutes. I had them ask questions. And I realized that one of the things that was putting them off, uh, and this was sadly happening in the context of it was a few months after the Sandy Hook tragedy, and that young man in some, some news reports had been alleged to have Asperger's. And so people, were, the kids were trying to understand autism, Asperger's. And I realized the A words were not getting me anywhere. So I said, OK, let's forget the A words. Uh, in the United States, we have a strong tradition of including people with disabilities. It's the law. We believe in it. Young people especially believe in it. We have ramps. We have, it's not like Europe. Everything is handicapped friendly, handicapped accessible. People with the deaf, the blind, the whole package. So I said to the boys, okay, how many people know somebody with a physical disability? And they look at each other, glasses. How many has a parent who has glasses? An uncle with a cane, with a hearing, oh, they all do. How many know somebody with a hidden disability? A kid who has trouble reading, or writing, or spelling, or, right? Uh, deafness, not obvious physical disability unless you're wearing a hearing aid. Oh yeah, they all knew that. I said, okay, autism is a kind of a social learning disability. And in some funny way, that may be a better way to think about this whole problem moving away from the A words. Uh, because at least in the UI US, when you think disability, you think, oh, then I need to make accommodations. What are the accommodations? And the kids then started asking questions. How could I relate to somebody who wants to talk to me about toasters? And you can say, OK, let's go with that. So say to the kid, I'd like to hear about something else you're interested in other than toasters. Or if you talk about toasters for a minute, can I tell you about my rock collection? Or, but again, many strategies that can come into play that it's easier, at least with this population, to think about it as a problem. And again, I realize there's a broader range, but for the folks who are really disabled to say, this is a social learning problem, you need to make accommodations. Slow things down. Keep it simple, help the person focus, tell them you're interested, you know, but don't just back away when they talk about the toasters. And you know, that's an interesting discussion and perhaps we'll have a chance to talk about it. So summing up, we know a lot more about autism than we did in the 1970s. At the same time, we know much more about the social brain, we know more about treatment, but there are many gaps in knowledge. We know relatively little about older adults. Uh, we need more treatment studies. We have challenges in terms of thinking about translating what we know into the developing world. And we have problems sometimes in translating research into implications for practice. And you heard from the Autism Society speaker, that's an area we really, as researchers, need to focus on. How do you translate what you know from this study into something that's meaningful in the lives of people with autism? So I want to thank my colleagues and students, as well as the parents uh, and my patients who've taught me so much. And I thank you for your kind attention. And I hope I've not put you to sleep. And you have to understand that the Yale Bulldog is the English Bulldog. <laughs>